Polo's uh, game that dates back to Persia, B.C. It's the most frickin' fun I've had in my entire life. If you want to play this sport at top level, it's a, it's a fortune. It's like having a, a few race cars. And, I mean, it's, the infrastructure is huge. It's a passion. It's a lifestyle. It's, it's uh, where else do you want to be today? It's, it's, it's wonderful. It's a big passion for, for many people in the world. And uh, I think that when it's such a passionate uh, sport, uh, it might slow down, but it's not going to disappear. All right, it's often called the game of kings, but less often these days in this recession, typically financed by sponsors and team members. Some polo tournaments this year have downsized, and membership across the world has reportedly dropped. And this weekend marked the 200, 2009 International Polo Challenge at New York's Mashomek Polo Club. Bruce Colley, an ambassador for the Federation of International Polo and a Mashomek member as well, uh, joins us now on set. Bruce, thanks for coming on the show. Thank you, Matt. Let's, nice start, to be here. let's start by talking about... Uh, uh, the match this weekend, how it went, and, and what the state of polo is right now. Well, the match this week was a uh, charity event held in uh, Meshomek, uh, upstate New York, and we had uh, probably six or seven hundred people who paid uh, to come and watch a fabulous match and raise money for American Donors uh, Association. So. Um, it didn't seem like people were balking at uh, contributing and coming out for a fun day. No, nonetheless, you have downsized as far as the games go. You play eight-goal polo now, or you did this weekend, rather than the 12-goal polo that you would have played maybe last year. Just explain to us quickly what that means. It's hard to get into two sentences, but what, what does it mean to shift down to well, eight goals? Well, le the level of polo is defined by, the, uh, by people's handicap. So the, higher, the better they are, the higher the handicap. And uh, beginners, of course, are, are very low handicap. So um, by eight goals, it means that it, it probably would be reflective in how many professionals are on the field. The game is very much divided into professional players, people make a living playing polo, and those that just enjoy it for the passion of, uh, of good sport, competitive time out with a bunch of friends on a polo field and uh, on beautiful horses. So um, the way to cut back on, one of the ways to cut back on the cost of polo would be to uh, not hire quite as many professionals on a team. Let, let's talk about the cost involved. Uh, how much does it really cost to play a game like this? I mean, you've got to buy the horses, obviously, keep them. You've got to bring up, uh, bring in pros. What, what, what do the costs look like? Well, it, it's, it varies tremendously uh, from from wherever you are, different parts of the world, and what level of polo you're playing. Uh, you can, at intro level, intro level, you can come in and have one horse, or you can go to your local club and probably pick up a game, uh, pay per hour, or you can buy a horse, buy a number of horses, and play uh, at the most competitive levels. Um, so it's sort of... It's pick your choice uh, what, what kind of level of polo you'd like to play. But you have done things at, at the Mashoma Club to help uh, continue to keep the game going, like fundraisers. You also have uh, a sponsorship drive going. How is it going? And because you, 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 you see, obviously, sponsors pulling back from all types of sports, sure. even high-end sports like golf. Uh, but polo, obviously, is a different kind of niche market. Well, there's, there's no question that... Uh, that the world of polo is greatly affected by the world financial markets and as the health of the world financial markets are affected so goes the world of polo so i think um, you're seeing a little bit of a, uh, a cut back a little bit across the world uh, and the various levels of polo in, in uh, different parts of the world um, in fip we have uh, 80 there are 84 countries in the world that play polo believe it or not uh, different polo associations and most of them belong to the federation of international polo um, one of the one of the goals of the Federation of Polo is to have a unified set of law, uh, laws, rules, standards, so that everybody in the world is playing the same type of polo. Therefore, uh, our goal is to get it back into the Olympics. 1936 was the last time it was played. And uh, by doing so, we have international competitions all around the world. These are the, the matches that get to be very expensive and some of the opportunities for uh, press and for television. And, uh, and therefore, that helps attract a lot of sponsorship. Uh, sponsorship is key to us in these last couple of years uh, as a result of these markets. We've lost a couple of key guys like Bear Stearns and uh, Stanford Financial, but as a result, that's created some wonderful opportunities for, uh, for LVMHs of the world, Viv Clicquot, Berluti, uh, Castello de Vicarello, some of the brands, Cartier, Rolex, um, some of these brands that can rifle shot their here's market. Sh here's a shot, by the way, of Bruce scoring a goal this weekend. <laughs> oh, boy. Cartier <laughs> is, you know, I think probably the sponsor that most people connect with Polo. H has there been any pullback on the, on, on the side of some of these sponsors, or do they 
uh, are they loyal to this market? I think they're very loyal to this market. I think it's it's a. Uh, it's right on their demographic um, and their target market. I, I think they're probably cutting back in some of the other broader based uh, marketing efforts, but uh, Polo seems to be one of the places that's holding up. And as some of the big guys have dropped out uh, for a variety of reasons, as I mentioned, um, some of the other fellows that are the, the luxury brands are stepping in. Okay, so, hey Bruce, thanks so much for joining us. That's all I have time for. Okay.